This is your day X World War III update. They're about to start a war with Iran and it's going to start before the election. Now, it's a very difficult situation and conversation to navigate at this point in time because there's a lot of disinformation. There's an ongoing psychological operation currently taking place between Israel and Iran. A lot of skullduggery, a lot of backstabbing, and a lot of Machiavellian plans at work. I'm going to try to help you decipher all of that today. So what's happening right now is Joe Biden, of course, recently had a phone call with Benjamin Netanyahu. Yoav Gallant, the defense minister in Israel, is now going to head to Washington to have a conversation with U.S. officials about the upcoming retaliatory strike on Iran. Now, Iran has said that any strike, be it from the air or from the ground, a cyber attack, acts of sabotage, will be immediately met the first time that they see the planes in the skies, they are doing an all-out launch on Israel. I told you guys it was going to be launch on warning, and that's essentially what it is. As soon as they see those birds in the sky, they are going to launch. Now, Vladimir Putin is meeting with the Iranian president, Pazeshkian, tomorrow in, I believe it's Turkmenistan, because there's some kind of conference going on. It's now... I would say 80% confirmed that the Iranians have S-400 uh, missile defense systems, which is going to uh, drastically limit Israel's capabilities when you factor in all of the other multi-layered air defense. So there is a, a good uh, chance that they're going to do something from the ground or something unconventional. It's important to understand that Israel is not going to be able to attack Iran like they attack Lebanon, where they have zero air defense. Israel has been playing on easy mode with no air defense to contend with and nobody with long-range weapon systems. And I'm very convinced at this point that Iran already has nuclear weapons or is in the process of finalizing those nuclear weapons simply by virtue of the fact that you have numerous officials within the Iranian government calling for the creation of nuclear weapons, a conversation that I don't think would even be allowed to publicly be started unless it, they were already far enough along that the process couldn't be interdicted by the United States. Now, if Israel did want to go for, say, the nuclear uh, facilities in Iran, this is going to be virtually impossible, okay? Uh, unless you stop short of using multiple bunker-busting nuclear warheads, there is no way that you are going to be able to penetrate Iran's bunkers unless from the inside out. What a lot of people don't know about the death of Nasrallah, the Lebanese, uh, not the Lebanese, but the Hezbollah leader, is that he died of asphyxiation. So the bunker, it turns out, actually worked despite all of the bunker-busting ordnance that they dropped on that place, I think it was something like 50 to 100 bunker-busters that they dropped on there, despite all of that, okay, the bunker actually remained intact. But what killed him was the fact that it was not outfitted with the necessary oxygen in order to keep people alive long enough so that the rescue team could get to him. So this is why in subsequent barrages of this sort, and assassinations, what the Israelis have been doing is making sure that no rescue crew can go in there for at least 10 days because they have breathing apparatuses in these bunkers now, which have, of course, limited supplies of oxygen. They finally got the idea that we should probably have some sort of contingency in case we do get entombed in here. And of course, when you see Nasrullah's body exhumed from the dust, you see that it's perfectly intact, which of course you would not likely expect if, uh, I, you probably wouldn't even expect to really find him if he was buried in that bunker. So we know that uh, these bunkers work and if Hezbollah's bunkers work, there's no way you're going through hundreds of meters of mountain of Iranian bunker, even with a nuke. And even then you're only going to entomb a certain part of it. So this means that in order for Israel 
to fight this war, they have to do a decapitation strike on the leadership. And the likelihood of that is extremely low, simply because of U Iran's, Iran's uh, vast paramilitary network, which numbers, I believe it's like 25 million. They're called the Basij, the Organization for Mobilization of the Oppressed. They're an offshoot of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is the IRGC. Of course, in terms of fighting force, the Iranians have 600,000 active duty troops. It's probably more than that when you factor in all of the other three-letter agencies. And they have 350,000 reserves, I do believe. And 600,000 of these besieged forces can be mobilized on a whim. So those are going to kind of be like your, I don't know, what would the equivalent be in Nazi Germany? Maybe like the brown shirts or something? Like the people who make sure that coups can't happen, okay? And the people who make sure that the Ayatollah is protected. And to have 25 million in a country of only 90 million, I would say you could probably do it with, uh, a number, you know, maybe three to five million. You, you really don't need that many people to police that large amount of people, a lot of women, a lot of children, you know, so you're really just contending with the dissident men. So we're faced with a very inauspicious situation. We don't know what Israel is about to do, but it appears as though they're about to do something. The gap between what Washington is having reservations about and what the Israelis want is narrowing by the day. And this is why Benjamin Netanyahu gave the green light for his foreign minister, Yoav Gallant, to go to uh, Washington to start to negotiate the final phase of this uh, reprisal deliberation. So we're going to see big things happen. Netanyahu is calling this an apocalyptic war, a war of revival. Defense Minister Gallant has said that the gates of heaven have opened and the time has come. This means that they've made the decision to attack. It's just a matter of when. Now, is this attack going to be massive? We could see a massive air assault, the likes of which we've never seen. They will go, they will try to target all of Iran's missile facilities, all of their offensive capabilities because they know and this is probably the smart thing to do when you think about it if you know that iran is just going to retaliate as iran has said the thing you have to go for is the missile silos uh, the question is do your missiles attack those missile silos before iran can get them off the ground and for all you know iran has a nuclear weapon on there i don't think that's going to be the case because historically speaking, in terms of disproportionality, it is always the Israelis who have escalated vertically. Uh, it's usually the Iranians who are escalating horizontally. That means they're not, they're responding, but they're not uh, raising Israel uh, one move, right? So when they responded with the missile attack, there were no fatalities. Uh, they targeted military facilities strictly and um, I think they targeted some radars that they effectively were able to hit. But this was compared to, you know, the, the attack that they incurred in terms of the decapitation of Hezbollah. Well, it was, uh, you know, it was not an even exchange. Uh, the Israelis clearly won that round. But things are getting very testy and the world is getting upset with Israel because there's been another contravention to UN 1701. This is the agreement that enforces the border between Lebanon and Israel. And right now there are UN teams, UN uh, peacekeepers that are armed, that are on the border. They're neutral, so they're not fighting back. But a couple of them got seriously injured, I believe, as a result of a Israeli barrage. They're not listening to Israeli instructions. Of course, the Israelis are saying that they're not doing their duty by enforcing uh, UN uh, Resolution 1701. And of course, this works both ways because when you look at the statistics, it's actually Israel who has done probably 10 times the amount of attacks since October 7th 
in that direction. Now, the Israelis will say, well, they started it, but it's a chicken and the egg sort of situation. It's like, when do you want to, you know, wh when are we measuring it from? What date are we measuring it from? <coughs> we know that Saudi Arabia is apparently backing out of BRICS. Now, this is significant because, of course, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia in particular are saying that they're not going to allow their airspace to be used by Iran, uh, by uh, Israel, I should say, because, of course, if they do that, Iran has said that they're going to light up all of the oil fields in the region. If they can't get any oil out, then nobody's getting any oil out. The question is, is this just skullduggery? Is this just the Saudis playing both sides of the fence right up to the very last minute, right up to the denouement, and about to backstab the Iranians and BRICS by not only allowing the Israelis and the Americans to utilize their airspace, but by participating in the offensive themselves. Because the Saudis have a lot of firepower. I don't know how you know, well-seasoned uh, their air force is in terms of being prepared for such an offensive, but they have a lot of weapons that they've been amassing and stockpiling. And I would not doubt... Who knows, maybe uh, they could get Pakistan to give them a nuclear weapon if they really wanted to. So Iran is going to be getting it from all directions. But Iran does have a very large and competent and battle-hardened axis of resistance from Syria to Iraq to Lebanon to the Gaza Strip where Hamas is still active. And quite frankly, Hamas so far is the only one that's really put up the best fight against what some people had thought, at least up until October 7th, was one of the most capable militaries in the world. I guess when it comes to shooting fish in a barrel, that is true. Uh, but they also have a lot of underhanded uh, mechanisms up their sleeves that have never before been seen, which are worthy of uh, respect, not in terms of you know, respecting uh, blowing up 3,000 or 5,000 pagers, irrespective of what the civilian casualties are, but just in terms of the sheer genius of that idea and the patience to withhold and not execute until the time was perfectly right. So you have to hand it to the IDF. They have uh, a lot of tricks up their sleeves. So even though the Saudis are, on the one hand, saying that they condemn Israel and they're paying all the lip service for their Muslim population who, of course, is seeking some sort of revenge for all this stuff that has happened. Just like Turkey, uh, you know, what they're doing is saying otherwise. So the Israelis right now are trying to set up a situation, I think, the only way they're going to win this in the long term is if they get regime change in Iran. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Uh, simply by virtue of the fact of the sheer numbers that Iran has. However, we do know that Iran is somewhat compromised. There was the IRGC brigadier general, the commander of the IRGC, the guy who essentially replaced Soleimani, who allegedly, and this is just allegedly, has been held for questioning and interrogation by the Iranians out of concerns that he might have been working for the Mossad and that he might have leaked all this information about you know, how they've been able to track all these people like Nasrallah. <coughs> now, they say that he's had a heart attack due to the interrogations, but the fog of war is so thick right now that for all we know, that is just misinformation being pumped by Israel and the Western media. And for all we know, that that's you know, not even true at all. Because first they were saying this guy was dead, remember. First they said, oh, he was dead, we killed him in an airstrike, and now they're saying, oh, well, he's actually being interrogated because they think he's a spy. Okay, now it could be that there could have been some blind swats in the occasion, and he allowed uh, this breach of security that basically caused the deaths of the, the entire uh, upper echelon of Hezbollah, but it's, it's unknown at this point in time because the information is so tightly controlled. And case in point, the Israelis are arresting reporters, even American reporters, 
who report on what's happening on the ground there. So if you get caught taking pictures or video that hasn't been cleared for publication by the IDF or Mossad, then you can go to jail, okay? And it doesn't appear as though the State Department is going to do anything about it. I mean, if the case of Gonzalo Lira in Ukraine is any metric, then I don't think we can expect, certainly not in Israel, they're not going to uh, heed, uh, hear those calls from those people who've been unjustly detained. Of course, the Israelis are saying it's a matter of national security, but this just calls into question all the information they provide us because, of course, that means that every piece of information they're providing is part and parcel of this psychological operation that they're trying to use to induce readiness fatigue in the Iranian military. They want the Iranian military to be constantly on edge and ex ex uh, exhausting their resources, exhausting themselves, preparing for this strike. And they want to create all kinds of confusion and suspicion, and they want infighting, and they're really trying to stoke uh, the civil unrest and stoke the flames of uh, insurrection there. And this is why they've rolled out the Shah's son, Reza Pavlavi. The Shah of Iran, of course, was overthrown by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, I guess you could say, and uh, the Ayatollah who supplanted him. And his son is now being rolled out in front of the masses to get reacquainted and uh, su suggesting that he would be willing to rule the country once again. And so the same ultimatum that's being given to Lebanon by the Israelis basically saying, if you don't overthrow your government and if you don't start a civil war with Hezbollah, we are going to turn Lebanon into the Gaza Strip. Now, the progress that they're making in the southern part of Lebanon is so gradual because they're taking major losses. Uh, snipers, booby traps, um, uh, what are they called, uh, IEDs, uh, you know, just the rocket launchers, anti-tank weapons. They're taking lots of hits right now in southern Lebanon. And so I can't see this situation progressing much longer in that direction without some major shit starting with Iran. Because now, of course, the pressure is on Iran. Because after, after Lebanon, which is their main proxy battleground, there's Syria, there's Iraq, which of course is uh, their sovereignty, it, while they, they still have the IRGC and the Iranian-backed militias there, you know, the, Iranian, the Iraqi government is more robust, arguably, against the, the, uh, the interests of the, the IRGC and its affiliates there. So they, and they do, of course, have an American military base, which is a foothold and a tripwire. So all this, basically, to summarize, uh, the war with Iran is coming very soon, okay? I could not see a situation where it doesn't happen before the election. And if it does not happen until the election, it won't be too long afterwards. It's an implacable situation. And because it really, it doesn't really depend like the Ukraine war does in terms of overt escalation, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't really depend on who the leader is, the leadership is, because both leaders are unwavering in their support for Israel. So it's implacable, it's unstoppable. We are going to war with Iran, and it's going to cause major disruptions, major disruptions. People have no idea what Pandora's box is being ready to be open. Now, in terms of the technicals of what is going on, I have some sources on the inside who are in countries related to the axis of resistance who are telling me that people there are, in fact, preparing for a war. Okay, the people in Iran are preparing for war. They're stockpiling. They are hoarding gas. 
There's and not necessarily panic buying yet, but people are starting to get into that mindset that war is coming. So there's a lot of consternation right now on that front. And essentially, the Israeli security cabinet is now expected to issue final approval for the retaliation strike against Iran with both Prime Minister Netanyahu and Minister Gallant being given authorization to decide the timing and execution of the strike. So this doesn't mean it's going to come immediately. But because Yoav Gallant is going to Washington, and based on what we've seen them do in when they killed Nasrallah, remember the UN General Assembly was going on. Okay, that was the crazy thing, is that Hezbollah presumed that they would never do something like that at that time. So right now, uh, the, the typical niceties of diplomacy and the, the things that you've become accustomed to with respect to how diplomacy is conducted are essentially been thrown out the window. So you have Israel attacking UNIFIL, which is the UN. You have them barring the uh, chief of the UN from coming into the country threatening arrest. Uh, so all the rules have gone out the window. So I would not be surprised if the attack happens as soon as Gallant touches down in the United States because they'll think, the Iranians might think, well, you know, Gallant's not in Israel, so they're not going to start the attack without him there. But it might just be the opposite because we have to think in a very sort of underhanded way in terms of how they're going to navigate this situation. In terms of what's happening on the Russian front, the Russian ambassador may be replaced with a Canadian Iranian ambassador, former head of the diplomatic mission in Canada and director of the North American Department of the Foreign Ministry, Alexander Darchev, may be the one who replaces the ambassador in uh, the Russian ambassador in Washington, because right now there is no Russian ambassador. But according to Russian sources, they're claiming that his role there was basically just uh, symbolic, uh, that there was no back channel communication or very little, and that in fact that he was fired by Vladimir Putin. Uh, that's the term. I don't know if it was a perfect translation with respect to the article I read but that he was removed from the position. And of course, he was receiving a lot of death threats. So that might have been something to do it. But maybe it's not so much fired. Maybe the translation, it's somewhere in between resignation and termination in terms of like, uh, I don't know, what do they call it? A voluntary discharge or something like that, where they were kind of nudged out of the position for their own safety. Uh, according to Mark Root, who is the new chief of NATO replacing Jan Stoltenberg, he is saying that you should not worry about a Trump's presidency if you're Ukraine. The politician noted that he knows Donald Trump, the Republican candidate, well and is convinced that the pumping of weapons into Ukraine will continue regardless of the outcome of the U.S. presidential elections. And I have to say that there's a lot of duplicity coming out of Trump's mouth lately with respect to just everything. The way he is groveling on his knees to Israel is quite pathetic, to be brutally honest. I've never seen it. They're all just coming out of the woodwork in a way we've never seen before. They got to have a lot of dirt on all these guys, okay, Trump included. And you're starting to see the tune change. Whatever happened to the anti-war, anti-interventionist president? As I've always stated, guys, you're voting for either the Iran war or the Ukraine war. Some people will say, well, we'll go with Iran because, which just sounds stupid, because why, right? Uh, but we'll go with the Iran war because it might not go as nuclear as quickly. But when you watch all of the, you know, and this is, this is fiction, but understand that the, there's a reason why the Russians are getting all their people out of Israel. Uh, there's a reason why the Russians are giving Iran their most advanced missile defense system and some of their most advanced fighter jets because they've chosen a side. And if Russia has chosen that side, that is their southern flank. There's no way in hell they're going to allow Iran to collapse. And there's no way in hell China 
is going to allow Iran to collapse. There's no way in hell North Korea is going to allow Iran to collapse. So <clears throat> the Russians have a vested interest uh, both geopolitically, geographically, and economically in making sure that the current Iranian regime, which is very friendly to the Russians, remains propped up. So they're not just going to let Israel and NATO walk all over Iran. Do they want Iran to engage in a war and start expending its material and manpower to take the heat off the Russians? Absolutely they do. There's no doubt about that. They are definitely, I think, in their own underhanded sort of way, provoking a war in the Middle East. And I'm not going to get into the details of how that came about, uh, but there's a lot of things that have happened that have seemed to be provocative in a very subtle sort of way that the Russians have been doing, uh, that have been goading the, the Iranians and the Israelis into going to war with one another. Now, in terms of what's happening on the Ukrainian front, it appears as though the Russians are preparing for a major offensive. You now have MiG-31s armed with Kinzhal hypersonic missiles inside Poland, for the first time in a year and a half, for the first time since we've seen the tactical nukes moved in that direction. And this signals that either they're getting prepared to bring Belarus into the conflict or they're parking those jets there knowing that Ukraine is not going to target them there. Because, of course, if they do, that's going to bring Belarus into the war. But maybe that's what they want. Maybe that's the long range check move or chess move is that the Ukrainians will still attack uh, Belarus, knowing that if Belarus attacks Ukraine, Poland is likely going to enter into the conflict in the western part of Ukraine to protect its Polish speaking people. And this, of course, is where NATO gets involved because, of course, Article 5. Now, you can have bilateral relations with a country and it's hard to delineate where uh, a bilateral agreement begins and NATO Article 5 ends but you know they could arbitrarily draw that line anywhere they want so just because Poland enters into western Ukraine doesn't mean that if the Russians get in a shooting match with the Poles in Ukraine it's going to necessarily lead to Article 5 right but there is a very high possibility of some sort of false flag attack happening between now and the election. Uh, allegedly, there's been a lot of attacks on uh, the nuclear power plant in Kursk that have been repelled. There's been numerous uh, attacks inside Russian territory that I talked about in my last video. The Crimean oil refinery is still burning. The uh, different storage facilities on the site keep going up one after the other. So this fire is persisting for days on end. And in terms of the price of oil, it's not surprising that we've seen CENTCOM get hit by Hurricane Milton. The price of oil dropped because everybody thought that this hurricane was going to be bad and it was going to postpone things for a few weeks. And it was bad, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been right? And we don't know the extent of the damage on U.S. CENTCOM. I'm sure there is some because there were some pretty serious winds and tornado activity throughout the Tampa area. But nonetheless, oil is basically back where it was for the most part, maybe a couple cents shy of its highs this month. Uh, but what that means is that we're about to see, I think, uh, the plan go back to what was pre-planned before Milton uh, presented itself. With that said, I got to get going because, as you can see, I'm still struggling with this illness that my children brought home. I'm going to keep you guys apprised uh, whenever I hear something, but 90% confident that we are going to see some attack by the Israelis, which will be met with a response from the Iranians, and then that's it. That's, it's game over. Game over as in the game will begin. The real war will begin. And this is when you start getting other countries involved in that particular conflict. You could see China move naval forces within, to the, within the region. I think they have six warships there right now, not a whole lot. But it's going to be contingent on what they do. You have the Iranian Navy, which is not the most advanced, but they have numbers. 
and they have a lot of small ships. They have kamikaze drones, uh, things of that nature. So it's hard to say what's going to transpire, but something big is about to go down. And I would not wait for all the other lemmings to, you know, be the, the cue that, that tips you off to, to take action and prepare for what's coming. Because once this chain reaction of events starts, I think it's going to unfold very fast. What the Israelis have demonstrated is that when they start something, they're going to finish it. Okay, it's once they've made the decision to start, you can bet that there's an end in mind. And we've seen that throughout the pager attacks and the targeted assassinations and the shock and awe bombardments and now the border incursion and now they're saying they're going to expand that. So we know they're just going to keep going. So we know that in order to prevent an attack on Israel that will cause a mass exodus from the country, they have to do the a decapitation strike of Iran's capabilities, which I think is going to be virtually impossible unless you have hundreds of warplanes. And uh, to coordinate all of that, that's going to take more than just Israel, it's going to take a coalition of many different countries in order to pull that off. And uh, judging by the response of a lot of the states who have those capabilities, they're not going to assist. Now, I still think many of them probably will. They're going to sheep dip a lot of those planes and a lot of those soldiers, and uh, you will see a massive attack. Or we're going to see something out of left field, because according to Iranian sources, the pagers that Hezbollah received came through Iran, okay? So it's effectively Iran's fault that that got through the supply chain to their proxies. So what that could mean is that there's still a lot of other technological devices inside Iran that are just waiting to go off. And the question is, are these things proximity activated? Are they activated by some kind of drone? You know, we don't even know how these things were activated. Why were they just activated by calling the number and entering in some sort of code, uh, some sort of hack? But chances are there's a lot of electronics out there that are still hacked in this way. So now, if you're Iran, you have to be doing a complete purge of all of the electronics that your military personnel use, which is a massive overhaul. And I'm guessing they're gonna to have to go directly to China or Russia for the technology to ensure that that sort of asymmetrical attack does not befall them as well. All I can say guys, we're inexorably hurtling towards a major catastrophe and you need to prepare. You need to prepare, you need to take care of your health, you need to be just stockpiling food. Uh, make sure you, you have a, a good water source, energy, off-grid power. Don't underestimate. Don't be one of these people who think you're going to live like a caveman because if the internet is still on, you're going to want to use your phone. And the very least, you need a smaller <coughs> off-grid solar system. I feel like my voice is progressively getting worse as we uh, go on in this video. Uh, forgive me for that, but... Doing what I can here, folks. All right, so you guys take care. If you want to support the channel, support it by supporting yourself. Use coupon code WW3SURVIVAL for 13% off all of your gear at CanadianPreparedness.com. I don't put these videos behind a paywall. I'm never going to do that. Uh, you know, I don't do advertisements uh, besides the ones that YouTube puts in there. And honestly, if you don't want the ads, I would strongly encourage you to get YouTube Premium. It's the best 12 bucks a month that you'll spend if you watch a lot of YouTube. No commercials, and there's a lot of other perks too. And just that in and of itself, the time that you save, not having to scroll through commercials, and you know, we creators still get compensated if you use that. So check it out, my friends. Take care. See you tomorrow.